Hello. Today we're going to talk about exercise metabolism in Chapter 4 of the Powers book. Specifically, we're going to look at fuel utilization during exercise. First, we'll start off talking about the respiratory exchange ratio and figure out what it tells us about fuel utilization. It's a really handy trick that you can use with a metabolic cart. And so we'll talk about that a lot. And we'll move into talking about the effect of exercise intensity and duration on fuel utilization. We'll talk about uh, concepts such as the crossover uh, point, fat max, and then we'll move into talking about lactate, how it can be used as a fuel during exercise. Now the, the purpose of bioenergetics is to funnel all the energy that we have in fats, carbohydrates, and proteins down into something that our bodies can use in the form of ATP. While there's plenty of energy and proteins uh, for multiple reasons, your body really doesn't use protein as an energy source during exercise. Totals maybe 2 to 10 percent of your energy uh, energy source during exercise. And quite honestly, under most conditions, it's going to be closer to that 2 end than the 10 percent. Uh, so most of our energy is coming from fats and carbohydrates. The respiratory exchange ratio tells us uh, how much of each is contributing to to our energy source. Now the respiratory exchange ratio, or the RER, sometimes just referred to as R, or the respiratory quotient, is something you can measure with a metabolic cart. Uh, so here we have an individual on a metabolic cart. Uh, we're capturing his exhaled air. That's uh, going down into uh, a little machine here that measures how much oxygen and CO2 is in his exhaled breath. In these graphs, you can see his VCO2, or the, the flux in CO2, CO2 production, during at rest and during exercise. And because of the Krebs cycle, CO2 production goes up. And here's the VO2 at rest and during exercise. The oxygen consumption goes up to resynthesize ATP as exercise intensity increases. Uh, nothing too earth-shattering here. Uh, what we have is the RER is the ratio between VCO2 and VO2 at a given work rate. Now, this will tell us quite a bit about what's being utilized. If you think about uh, the sources of CO2 and oxygen consumption, uh, when you do glycolysis, you get CO2 being produced uh, in the when you go from pyruvate down to acetyl-CoA, you get one acetyl-CoA produced. And then that acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle and produces several more CO2s. In the process, it yields some NADHs and FADH, which then make their way down to the electron transport chain to be consumed in oxidative phosphorylation or aerobic ATP resynthesis. So you get these CO2s being produced in the process of getting oxygen consumed. When, when you're using carbohydrates, the ratio is usually one to one. Uh, you get, for every CO2 produced, you get one O2 consumed. So carbohydrates have an RER of one. In contrast, fats have a lower RER, usually of 0.7. So a lower RER, and that's because uh, they bypass some of the CO2 production. You can get NADHs and FADHs produced without CO2 production. If you remember with beta-oxidation, we start with our fatty acid, uh, This, in this case a palmitate with 16 carbons, and through beta-oxidation it's broken down into multiple acetyl-CoA's. Those acetyl-CoA's then enter into the citric acid cycle, bypassing that first CO2 produced, and now we go in the citric acid cycle and produce multiple NADHs and FADHs while producing a couple CO2's. But now look what happens also in beta oxidation. You produce NADHs and FADHs in the process of just breaking up the fatty acid. And so these NADHs and FADHs go down into the electron transport chain, completely bypassing all these CO2 production sites. So you get NADH and FADH driven uh, oxygen consumption without CO2 production. And for that reason, fats have a lower RER than carbohydrates. Again, fats being at 0.7 if you're oxidizing pure fat, and if you're oxidizing, pure, oxidizing purely carbohydrates, it'll be an RER of 1.0. So what happens with the RER 
and exercise intensity. Well, it's pretty simple. As you increase exercise intensity, the RER increases. At rest, you're usually at about an RER of 0.85. And then as exercise intensity increases, you begin to use more and more carbohydrates, less and less fats, and the RER increases. Uh, a point to note, once you get to over 1.0, this signifies a point where you're really not at steady state, and the RER is being driven by a couple of other things, uh, like uh, uh, acids getting into the bloodstream can then go into an equilibrium state with CO2. And so when you produce more acids, it drives up CO2 and can increase the VCO2 without being related directly to metabolism. So that's what go goes on when you get an RER above 1.0. Uh, RERs, here's a table with it. Again, an RER of 0 0.7 would signify that your metabolism at that point in time is almost purely from fat oxidation and 0% from carbohydrates. If you get up to an RER of 1.0, that would signify the opposite, that almost everything's coming from carbohydrates. Another point to note with this table is that the efficiency or how many calories you can burn per liter of O2, or how many ATPs you can generate per liter of O2, is greater with the carbohydrates. So you can get, per oxygen, when burning carbohydrates, you get more ATP back, slightly more, not a ton. Uh, but part of this is because you have that anaerobic component of glycolysis that drives up the ATP number. And again, the, the resting RER is usually somewhere around 0 0.8, or 0 0.85. So now, what happens to fuel utilization as you increase exercise intensity? And this is where we're going to talk about something very key called the crossover concept. So based on what we've already talked about with the RER, we've said that RER increases with exercise intensity. So what would that mean for fuel utilization? As you increase exercise intensity, is fat utilization going to go up or down? And remember, an RER closer to 1 means more carbohydrates, less fat. So as exercise intensity goes up, we begin to use more carbohydrates and less fat. And this is a graph from your, the Powers textbook that illustrates that simple idea. The y-axis is percent total fuel source. So the contribution that glycogen, glucose, free fatty acids, and triglycerides all make to energy expenditure at 25% of VO2 max, which would be something like walking around really slowly through uh, your neighborhood, you're burn burning mostly free fatty acids. It's So the fats are a big source of your energy there. When you increase exercise intensity, you begin to shift to having more muscle glycogen, illustrated in the blue, or more plasma glucose, and less that makes up less of a contribution to the total energy expenditure. So this graph here is an illustration of something called the crossover concept. And what it shows is the percent energy from fats or carbohydrates on the y-axis and then uh, intensity of exercise illustrated by VO2 max on the x-axis. So as you start at a low exercise intensity, you get the vast majority of your energy is coming from fats. But as you increase exercise intensity, that goes down and decreases and decreases until you get to very high intensities where fats is, are not making a huge contribution. In contrast, as you increase exercise intensity, carbohydrates and utilization of carbohydrates increases. You have this point right in the middle where they intersect where carbohydrates go from being less predominant to more predominant. That's called the crossover concept, or the crossover point. So what I want you to get from this is that when you increase exercise intensity, you go from using more fats to more carbohydrates as intensity increases. And the point where they, they change is that crossover point there. So what does this say about when you burn the greatest amount of fat? Remember, this y-axis is percent 
of energy expenditure. It's not total energy expenditure. As you increase exercise intensity, energy expenditure goes up or increases. So the crossover point doesn't necessarily represent the point at which you'll burn the most fats. It just represents the point where fats is the predominant fuel source. All right. So if we look for the point where you burn the most fats, that's called fat max. And it's illustrated in this graph over here uh, in the purple where you can see that as exercise intensity increases, fat oxidation, uh, the absolute amount of fat oxidation will increase because you're just burning more calories by exercising. And then once you get somewhere around 60%, 70% of VO2 max, the, the amount of fats being utilized goes down. So if you misinterpret the crossover concept, you might think that the best way to burn fats is just to walk around your neighborhood and not not do a lot of exercise because you're burning more carbohydrate or more fats that way. But that's not the case because the absolute amount of energy expenditure is pretty low at 25% of VO2 max. At 60% of VO2 max, while fats don't make up the predominant energy source, because the amount of energy that you're burning is much greater overall, the amount of fats being burned is greater at 60%. So why is fat oxidation inhibited as exercise intensity increases? There are multiple reasons. One of the first reasons uh, goes back to the, the size principle. If you remember, as exercise intensity increases, as you need to generate greater amounts of force or power, you recruit more and more motor units, and you start to get these type 2A and type 2X motor units being recruited. And these uh, have a much more glycolytic capacity than lipolytic capacity, meaning they're much better at breaking down carbohydrates than they are about breaking down fats. Another reason for decreased fat oxidation with exercise intensity has to, has to do with epinephrine release. Remember, as you increase exercise intensity, you have the sympathetic response, which results in the release of epinephrine from the adrenal gland. And so epinephrine concentrations go up as you have greater and greater rates of extra or greater exercise intensity and that epinephrine then stimulates phosphorylase which is the enzyme that breaks down glycogen in the muscle and so epinephrine will stimulate the phosphorylase and drive gly glycolysis that way so they essentially favoring glucose breakdown but if you remember when we talked about signaling for for lipolysis Epinephrine also stimulates hormone-sensitive lipase, which breaks down triglycerides in the adipocytes. So if epinephrine was the only reason for the decreased mobilization of fat during intense exercise, it, it just doesn't make sense. But another thing that happens when you have that epinephrine being utilized, the epinephrine stimulates that phosphorylase, which drives glycolysis, and you'll get more lactate being produced, more lactate coming out of the cell. That lactate then goes into circulation and actually inhibits hormone sensitive lipase, the enzyme responsible for mobilizing fats from the adipocytes. So lactate itself inhibits fat oxidation. And that is illustrated in this study by Liu et al. in 2008, 2009. They exposed human adipocytes that they, they grew, they biopsied and grew. And and they, they expose them to different levels of lactate. And what you can see in panel D is that as they expose them to greater levels of lactate, which are actually in like the, the five to 10 range or reasonable levels or physiological levels, they had the adipocytes release less fatty acids when stimulated. So lactate inhibits the mobilization of fatty acids. And that's where we'll end for this part of the lecture. I'll pick up on the next section for, or in the next video for the rest of the lecture.